So welcome everyone. Welcome to the April meeting. Let's roll. Now I have to really talk fast. So here's the board. Here's a list of the board members. Uh, in the room here, there's uh, Vice President John, Treasurer Matt, Secretary Trina. That's it. Conrad's at home recuperating, and Gunner. Maybe he's on. Um, but here's our faces. Welcome, new members. Are there any new members in the house? There's only four of you. New member, welcome. Welcome. There's something we haven't done in two years. And all the other two, all the other members that are online, um, even if we, if your name isn't listed here, we're going to work that out. We'll get that figured out. Um, and uh, it'll be better in next month, and maybe we'll repeat some names, you know. So we'll see where that goes. Um, but I want you to know that uh, the MAS is a fabulous organization. I've been part of it for almost, maybe almost 12 years. I'm not sure I will. I lost track because I'm having so much fun. And that's the key is this club is a lot of fun. There's a lot of experience. There's a lot of people that know things. All you have to do is ask. Um, and just by asking the question, somebody will direct you to somebody that may be able to answer your question. You know, that's the, that's the best thing about this club. So, and then there's like opportunities galore to volunteer, get involved. That's how you meet the other people in this uh, organization is you just volunteer, you show up, show up at star parties, volunteer, help out. Um, it's, uh, it's fabulous. So welcome, welcome new members. And, oh, look at that, treasurer's report. Okay. We have money, how's that? We don't have time, <laughs> we gotta cut it short. Yeah, I mean, we, we have money. We have ample, ample cash on hand for anything we need to do to run the organization. Um, we, we've had um, some normal operating expenses, nothing out of line. Um, the board's on top of it. Um, and, you know, we're going to spend money because we just, we just approved our budget and we're going into that season where we're getting ready for our public star parties. We're getting facilities ready. So, yep, you're going to see money spent every month. So, Oh, that's right. The check we just paid our insurance. Forty. Oh, yeah. So even with the things we did to modify it, it's still five thousand dollars. So we budgeted for it. We're okay. Don't don't worry. We're protected. That's the most important thing. Anybody gets hurt, we lose anything, buildings, equipment, it's all protected. That's what we want. Thank you. Thank you, volunteers. Anybody that has helped out that I didn't name here, but I especially want to point out Lila, Suresh, you know, Suresh has uh, run the uh, B-SIG through the winter. Um, he did that all on Zoom. Um, it, I, I attended a few of those. They were just fabulous. He lined up some excellent talent. Good job, Suresh. And Lila, you know, Lila's got a tough job because she's got to go out there and go, hey, we got some people to show our talent off to by doing some outreach. And so she lines all that up. If you want to become involved on uh, outreach, there's a whole form on that. That's where she posts those. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm doing one next Thursday, as a matter of fact. Almost full moon and all. Should be fun. I guess we're going to look at the moon. And then there's everybody else. Um, CGO work party, Messier marathon people. Uh, website stuff, all fabulous stuff that's going on. Okay, briefly, the Constitution is back in our hands from the lawyer. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it tonight. Basically, we want you to know that get ready, we're coming. Um, it's been revised. The board's going to scheme on Sunday as to how we're going to get a quorum. Um, between a Zoom call and in the house here in May. Um, we got to come up with a scheme because, you know, tonight I think we only are about 70 people probably between online and here. So we have some work to do there. But in May, we're going to have answer and uh, question and answer session and a little bit about what's changed. In reality, for you, 
that are the normal regular members, nothing's changed. You know, we're, it's, it's, we've written down how we've been doing business for the last 50 years. The biggest changes are the board, how the board operates. We've defined some things about the board and, and, and how they're elected and who they are and what their responsibilities are, blah, blah, blah. You'll hear more about it next month. And we're going to post it. It's going to be, it's going to be posted everywhere. We're going to try and get it as a PDF online. Um, and then um, MailChimp email is going to come out. We're going to blast you with that probably a couple of times, maybe more. Um, every time I think of it, maybe we're going to blast you. Because you got to know what's going on. And if you have something to say about something that we're going to change, we want to hear that. And chances are there's a 90 percent chance that we aren't going to be able to do anything about it because of what we're trying to do. We're trying to become a non-exempt, tax-exempt charitable organization. And to be tax-exempt, there's a whole ton of regulatory things that we have to do to meet or else you don't get it. They just toss you out. So that's the key is we want to save we want to stop paying taxes to the state of Minnesota for everything that we buy. And we buy a lot of stuff. Now, moving on. Next meeting right here again in this house. We're going to record it. It'll be posted online. I'll get it edited. Give me 24 hours. It'll be there. Just a reminder about Slack. The Slack admin is in the house tonight. If anybody has a question, Chris sent us. Um, anybody wants to, any, any help getting signed up, whatever. He's right there. Um, so see him. It's a, it's a fabulous tool. We use it as a board. Um, it, it, it works great. It's easy to communicate. You post a message there and you come by and pick it up later and respond, whatever. And then it has the ability to do live video, audio, share screen, the whole thing that we do with Zoom. We do that on Slack. It just wouldn't work very well for a meeting like this. All right, we are on YouTube. I checked yesterday, 144, 141 subscribers. That's pretty cool. Um, you know, these meetings, when they're recorded after they're posted within a couple of weeks, there's already up to 30 or 40 views. Now, some of those guys like Jerry Jones, I'm sure, goes on there and just watches it over and over again. Jerry, you know, I love you. I know how I screwed up. Yeah, right. You like to go back and critique yourself. I get it. Just do a search for Minnesota Astronomical Society on YouTube. All right, you go for it. Anton's in the house. Anton, there's a microphone right here by Jerry. Jerry, this way. Anton's our loaner scope program guru extraordinaire. Okay, well, uh, as always, members can borrow one of our now 17 loaner scopes for a month, you um, just apply for it on the website under members on the loaner scope program, make your choice, and then that'll send an email to me and I will set you up with a loaner scope. Um, I brought in for show and tell our latest edition, just um, from the gener uh, generosity of Father Brown, a Skymaster um, 25 by 100 binoculars on a fine overwork tripod, the red dot finder, plus all the usual things like um, the deep sky map and pocket sky atlas and planisphere, red flashlight, all that stuff. And I have the clipboard here with me tonight. So if there's somebody here who would like to take it home, see me after the meeting and we can set you up. Thank you, Anton. Any questions from anybody in the house? Anton does a fabulous job managing this thing. It's, it's incredible. Did you say anything about the DVD courses? Oh, we got the DVD courses, and everybody's seen them online. Everybody's online can see them. Philip Panko, yep. Philip Panko, yep. Oh, this is your invitation to take a peek at the new website. The new MAS reworked, worked over um, uh, website is, is up for prelim, um, you know, go in there and provide 
creative, constructive feedback. There's a specific form. I've listed that there. Um, I've seen it a lot. It's, you know, maybe too much. I'm not probably not seeing the things that are wrong anymore, but there are some, there's some stuff, you know, and there's some stuff that is yet to be implemented. We, you know, one of the goals we wanted was we wanted a reservation calendar for equipment and, and observatories and things like that. I understand that's a huge task and it's coming. Patience, please. It's, it's, it's been a big job just to take the old one and, and wash out all the bad stuff and put it on this new site. We'll get there. I mean, but at least we're going to turn this thing loose so we can start using it. Um, it's, it's mobile friendly. It's, you know, your phone, your tablet, and then of course your browser, um, you know, you know, it just makes it bigger is all it does. Well, you have anything to say you're, you're here, but you've been busting your butt on this thing for years. Excellent. Thanks, Walt. Question. That's going to be the address temporarily until we go live. Then it'll be the old one because the new part will just drop out of there. Dean. It's downloaded and going to be stored on, on uh, uh, magnetic tape. <laughs> Okay, punch tape. I like that because then eventually it deteriorate and just go away. No, there's nothing wrong with the old site. And we were we were talking about this over dinner is that, you know, the current website, the way it is right now, it's still better than about 95% of all the other astronomy clubs in America. It's still better than theirs. It, it's up to date. It's updated. It's cared and fed, you know, but we just want it better. We want it more mobile friendly. We want it easier for you to do things on the tablet. We want it secure. The old one was not secure. Anything else? There will be, will be. Patience, Ron. I know that's your most, that, I know you, that's, that's your world, that's your life. I, and I appreciate that. No, I mean, you know what I mean. Yes, you're a calendar guy. I understand that. Yes, I do. It's mostly just, no, never mind. So this, this weekend is the statewide star party. The MAS is involved in five sites. Um, Bellwin, Buffalo Public Library, uh, Mark Boyd and I, Mark Boyd is in the house tonight. Um, he and I are hosting, hosting at Buffalo Public Library. We're going to set up telescopes in the parking lot with all the lights on, so that should be good. But we'll be all right. We'll see some things. Uh, Cedar Creek, Dave Faulkner is going to lead that up there. He's doing a presentation. There's going to be a bunch of people up there, too, with telescopes. Um, Eagle Lake is doing their own thing. Um, they're doing, you know, it's, it, it was a public night there. Um, they're they have a special speaker, Michael Copper, is on at seven o'clock there. He's going to do something associated right with the theme of uh, this year's star party. Um, and I know Bellwin, Buffalo, Cedar Creek, Long Lake, I know that all of them got kits from the Bell Museum for activities for kids and families. Um, the kits are fabulous. There's, you know, very generous with the supplies. There's like 50 people that are going to, actually there's more. 50 people could take a set of everything that was in that box home. Um, and so, I mean, if there was 50 families there, everybody would get one thing. Um, so that's they're very generous from the, uh, from the Bell Museum um, and, and, and what they've provided. And we sat through a, we sat through a training and uh, we know how to do all that stuff. I do anyway, Mark, I guess maybe. I think Kate, Caitlin did it for up at Cedar Creek and um, ELO, you guys are skipping out. 
but that's okay. You guys have like a gazillion telescopes out there, so. Get the non-cultural people. Right. You guys will have fun. So, I guess the big point that I wanted to make here is, if you're an MAS member, you don't have to be a key holder at any of those sites or anywhere. Um, I'm sure if you showed up that night, somebody would give you something to do, and it's not that hard. You know, there's nothing. There's nothing complicated about it. Um, if not, there's like five people standing behind you. You can ask a question. So, so if you ha if you ha have time and you're available and are willing to do that, you know, there's 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 those sites that that um, that URL on the bottom. You can go there, you can contact the person that is in charge that's hosting that site, and let them know that you're coming. Um, that that give them some peace of mind. So, events before, what's up with the feedback? Oh, the two of us getting together, huh? So I'll stand here then. Events before the next meeting, first quarter moon. Um, what's, what's the day today? Seven, eight, nine, Saturday. Um, and then Paul X. Uh, the most exciting thing on there for me is uh, not even the Lyrid meteor shower. It's too close to the moon. Uh, yeah, so the moon will be up at the same time the shower is good, uh, but that doesn't mean you're not going to see anything. So I would still go out if it's a nice night. I'm going out. Might even send a camera up. Um, last quarter moon, and then there's the the party in the morning, as I like to call it, with the moon, the Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. Um, Venus will be there too, I guess. I guess I left Venus off of there. Um, so it's kind of a big party. They're all, and what's really cool is there's one day where I think the moon gets out of the way a little bit and might even be dim enough where you're going to be able to see them all nice and aligned with the moon and kind of high enough too. Uh, Mercury will be missing, but uh, Mercury, it's kind of hard to see anyway most of the time anyway for me because where I live, too glowy. Um, and then new moon. Um, a conjunction with Jupiter on April 30th. That's before our next meeting. That's close because that should fit into everybody's telescope. Yeah, 12 bark minutes is what I, it was 0.2 degrees. So 0.2 times 60 is 12. Yeah, 12 arc minutes. So that, that's going to be cool. A partial solar eclipse. Oops, ah, that's way down there at the end of South America. Yeah, not here. <laughs> and then the it would be cloudy anyway. Jerry. <laughs> you get a little bitter about eclipses, Jerry. <laughs> oh crap! I wish I would have remembered. Yeah, it's the second new moon in the month. It's got to be a dark moon. <laughs> Thank you, Ron, for that. Thanks for, I, you know, I had that in the back of my head when I, when I was, yeah, I did, when I was preparing this slide. I should have put it on there. It's on Ron's calendar. Ron, you know, I do have your calendar. It's that, it's that weather calendar from Carol Evan. That's, that's where you are. Okay, on May 5th, there's a, another meteor shower. That one will actually be pretty good since uh, April 30th is a new moon. And that's like five days later. By the time the shower starts, it's, the moon will be down. So that'll be kind of cool. So what, somebody help me out. Uh, the constellation is Eta, Eta, the, the, for the Eta, Eta Aquarius is where the, Radiant is. Thanks, guys. You guys are really good. <laughs> but you people online, you guys are missing it, I'm telling you. Oh, wait, maybe if I was standing in front of the camera, maybe. Yeah, once in a while when I wander in. Upcoming star parties. Eagle Lake is the place to be uh, for public star parties. 9, 23, May 7th, that's the one you really should be gearing up for because that's astronomy day. That's that's all day and all night until the last person goes home. 
Um, and then member star parties, Virgo Venture at Cherry Grove um, that last weekend in April, and then two weekends at Long Lake LLCC. Um, you got to sign up on the form. So go on the forums to the LLCC form. There's a specific reservation on there or a, a entry, um, a post that you have to go on and sign on to let people know you're coming so that they have a, they have a room for you if you're gonna stay overnight. Fantastic site. COVID, as everybody knows in this room, we're maskless here, everyone, except for a couple people, but that's okay. We say that, that that's good. That's okay, and that's the way uh, the board is following the guidance of the state of Minnesota, the CDC. They say we're okay now. We can do that um, for the time being. Until something, until the next shoe drops. Um, so that includes this meeting. But just a reminder, and I shouldn't have to say this: if you're feeling ill, you've been around somebody that's ill, please don't come spread spreading here. Um, please stay home. We, we who are healthy would appreciate that. I don't have time to be sick. That's just it. Got too much going on. Messier Marathon Report. Chris Sentence has the floor. Is that mic on? Is it on? Perfect. Okay. So this Saturday we had the uh, annual Messier Marathon. Uh, it was cold. It was at Cherry Gold Grove. And uh, I have some certificates to hand out. Um, and that some of these people might be watching online or watching later, that's fine. Uh, we had a go-to category this year and only one sheet was handed in for the go-to category. So Scott Hash gets first place for 25 objects. And for the normal Messier Marathon, uh, John and Emily Myers um, take third place with 25 objects. It was a father-daughter duo. I took second place with 76 objects. And Don, stand up or come here. Uh, Don, Don went above and beyond what I thought was even possible. Um, he got 104 objects. So, um, on, on my checklist that I create, uh, I use one of these online sites, the, the McNish site for creating a Messier Marathon site and just left the defaults in. And a lot of the objects he was getting were below the, the, the uh, limits on, on what that site says is possible. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, he got 104 and it's amazing. So congratulations. <laughs> Uh, I think it was towards the end of the night. Um, oh, what is it? It was over there in uh, is the M15, the globular cluster off of. That was a really hard one towards the end of the night. Yeah. So, anyway. Thank you, Chris. That's that's awesome. Considering, I believe everywhere here in the Twin Cities area, I don't think we saw nothing. Yeah, it was cloudy at my house. It wasn't even, I wouldn't even give it the, the Jerry Jones uh, sucker hole chance. There's no way. So good job. You guys are looking. What's that? Plenty of Minnesota. Plenty of Minnesota. Yeah, but unfortunately, it doesn't have a Messier number. Oh, yeah. All right, Steve, the first one to spill during a, a monthly meeting. At least it's water. <laughs> Yeah, it's not what it was. <laughs> wow. <sighs> okay, moving on. Beginner special interest group. Um, nothing in the month of April, the field's too wet, um, was what I was told, but there's two events scheduled for May. We'll talk about those next month. But watch your forms, watch your website. Um, details will be posted there, is what I've been told. Call for Gemini articles. Uh, Father Brown is always looking for a good article. 
And uh, if you have something, have done something, have an experience, um, write, your, write it up. Um, between you and Father Brown, you'll work out and create a very nice article to be presented in our Gemini. Um, Father Brown takes great pride, as the rest of the membership should too, is the fact that you know all of our articles are written by the, by the MAS members. There's nothing from the outside that's brought in to fill in our newsletter every quarter, quarter? Oh, by any, by monthly. So thank you to those that write. Um, writing is not my passion, so it's really hard for me. Um, so I appreciate, I appreciate the Gemini and I appreciate everything Father Ron does and all his editing team. I know, I'm not even very good. Jerry Jones. Good evening, everyone. So it is my pleasure to present just one uh, Astronomical League Award. However, to an individual who has, I don't know, finished what, 15 or 23 in the last two months? Just kidding. Dave Tosteson, come on up, Dave Tosteson. Dave Tosteson. All of you no doubt have read his articles in all the various uh, astronomical magazines. So he is one of our celebrated uh, observers of, so how many years have you been observing? 35. 35 years, 37. 37 years. And you finally, 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 finally got around to looking at the sun. It's about, it's about time. <laughs> probably was so, sleeping. <laughs> Yeah, that there you go. So it is my pleasure to at least this is the one I've been able to I've been able to present to you the hydrogen alpha solar program award. Congratulations. Thank you. And I would like you to share with the rest of the group. How many others have you done in the last couple of months? Well, since September, there's 12. Seriously, but since we haven't been meeting in person, they've, you know, it hasn't come to. The... So which ones? Do you want me to tell you? I do. This guy's a serious observer. Yeah. Um, it's amazing. I have him in alphabetical order, but. It... How many awards do you have? Let's start, let's go back. About 36. Okay. That was well-timed. Well-timed. Solar system, solar system binocular, Galileo, Galileo binocular, sun spotter, Hydrogen Alpha Sun, Stellar Evolution, uh, Active Galactic Nuclei, and there's a couple more I can't remember. But you know, and that's worth applauding for. Well done, Dad. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you for your. Oh, and now Jerry is going to do. Oh, it's my turn now. Well, yeah, you said swap my. Oh, Jerry, your slide, your last slide. Oh, my last slide this? Get out there oh, and so observe. You didn't, give me, you didn't give me time to set up, eh? Well, it's because you're busy. That's right. It's okay. Take a couple seconds. You have, you have 21 minutes. Awesome. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to present the Better Know Constellation. And let me share my screen how am i doing awesome okay doing well so now. this today's presentation tonight's presentation is entitled the king the queen and the crown of galaxies um typically uh typically this presentation is about one or maybe at most two two uh constellations but this time of year is special in the sense that uh, in the summertime we're looking towards the center of the galaxy. In the winter time, we're looking towards the uh, the outer, uh, looking back the other direction through an, an arm of the, our galaxy. But during the fall and the spring, we're looking towards the out of our galaxy, and in particular, we are then able to see tons of other galaxies. And so, what I wanted to do is I want to take a couple of minutes and just talk a little bit about just what what's available for us to see when it comes to galaxy season which is indeed the spring 
So the first one, the king, it kind of makes sense, is Leo. Leo the lion is pretty much in the, there, it is right around the center of, uh, of galaxy season. Leo is, uh, as you can see there, let me, let me get rid of his, his clothes. There we go. This is what we're used to seeing as far as Leo is concerned. Um, he's one of the 44 Ptolemaic constellations, member of the Zodiac. He's the 12th largest at 947 square degrees. Um, the, uh, the mythology, uh, most of the Greek and Roman, he's the Nemean lion that was uh, killed by Hercules. He's the first of either his 10 or 12 tasks, depending on how you count them. Most, most ancient civilizations do see him, or mythologies do see him as a lion, although it's interesting that the Sumerian mythology suggests that he's, a, he's the monster whom Baba was killed by Gil Gilgamesh in the Gilgamesh stories, which is kind of cool. It does sport quite a number of double stars, Regulus being one, uh, Denobula being another, Algebra being another, and uh, and I I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this just because there's there's so many other things to take a look at. But uh, uh, this one, uh, Algebra is is a particularly beautiful double. It's it's uh, four uh, about four arc seconds, so it's pretty close. You need you need some good magnification, but it's a beauty. And this is another beauty here, uh, 54 Leo, which is a little wider, 6.5 arc seconds, but it is a beautiful white blue combination and, and those are the ones I find are really neat when the, the colors are such that you can really see the difference doesn't have any any carbon stars uh, to speak of but it has tons of galaxies now I've set uh, just to kind of give you an idea what's going on I've set the uh, at for for the sky safari I've set it for 9.4 you can see that so mag 9.4. So the galaxies we're first going to start with are galaxies that you should be able to see in a fairly uh, modest telescope in uh, in suburban skies, uh, around nine to nine to tens. And so you're going to see right away that there are two sets of galaxies right here, 96 and 105. Now these are Messier uh, objects, and they're they're 9.1, 9.2. They're right around the same size. They're going to be about the same about the same. Uh, uh, brightness and over here is what is lovingly called the Leo triplet. Now these two are the Messier objects, 66 and 65, and they're again right around the same, 8.9, 9.1, uh, 10, uh, 10 by 4 uh, arc arc minutes for uh, 66 and and uh, 9.7 uh, by 2 arc minutes for 65. So. This one is is interesting because it's so close and it's it's an it's 9.1 another spiral galaxy it's a little bit larger 11 by three and it's just interesting that Messier missed it, uh, but this is really a lovely thing to see that's really worth taking a peek at so. Uh, again suburban skies a modest telescope that's kind of what you're going to see now we're going to come down over here and here's the queen of galaxies, which is Virgo. Uh, Virgo was always portrayed as a as a as a woman. Uh, Virgo means virgin. It's typically associated with springtime plantings and spica down here. Uh, the the uh, one of the definitions of spica is an ear of grain, and we know spica from the whole thing from learning how where to find things. You find the Big Dipper, you arc to Arcturus, and you speed on to spica. And so that's uh, that's kind of where we're where this is at. And and. Uh, there are some cool doubles, uh, but not very many. Uh, and and uh, so we're going to just scoot two galaxies. Now, again, we're set at 9.4, and you can begin to see some of these galaxies. Many of these are Messier objects. That one doesn't happen to be. There are 11 Messier objects from 8.3 to 9.6, and they're kind of all over everywhere. And uh, and we're going to talk about that one just in a second, and uh, and and I want to talk a little bit about this. Uh, was, there was a sky and telescope. Was it April or was it March? Is that me? <laughs> um, so uh, so uh, one of the most recent sky and telescope magazines did a wonderful article on the Markarian chain. What I want to do here is, is while there are quite a number of galaxies, again, are 11 Messier 
optics. So you should be able to catch those in a, in a modest scope. I do want to share something, and I'm guessing most of us know this, but even though it's really cool, I'm gonna up the, uh, up the mag to about 11, and, and we're gonna see something in here. I'm gonna get this to move without I can. I'm gonna move this out of the way over here. And we begin to see something in here, which is really very cool. Now, those of you who have seen this in, in a telescope, uh, even from a dark sky site or from a moderate sky site, these are really wonderful. And let me share with you a photograph of what it looks like. Uh, this is part of the Markarian chain. And what's absolutely cool is if you, if you get a large enough telescope and you get a dark enough sights, this pops out just like this. It is so unbelievably cool. Even in a modest telescope, you're gonna be able to see this face. Now you can see that this middle one is not showing because it's a, it's a little bit dimmer than 11, but this is so much fun to find. And again, uh, spring is where you get a chance, get a, to get a chance to find them. Now we're gonna, we're gonna move a little out of the way and then come back to it in a bit. We're, we're gonna come back, we're gonna go back to about nine and to the, uh, to the crown of galaxies, which is Coma Berenices. Now Coma Berenices, is an interesting constellation in the fact, in the sense that it's the only constellation that honors an historic figure, Bernice II, who was the co-ruler of the Egyptian uh, pharaoh Ptolemy III, right around 250 BC. The story is that uh, Ptolemy went off to fight in the Third Syrian War. Bernice was a little nervous that her, her, her husband might not get back. Uh, and so she offers her hair in sacrifice in the hopes that Ptolemy returns. Uh, so what she did is she took her, she must have had gorgeous locks. She, she took her hair, obviously cut it off, and put it in the temple. And somebody stole it overnight. Uh, however, there was a quick thinking court astronomer who decided, I know where it is. And, and said it was, it's in the stars. And we have a really a magnificent open cluster right here, Mela 111, which... Uh, it really does look, if, if you're if in the right perspective, it really does look like dangling hair. But so, uh, so that's where that got started. I would imagine that the, uh, the, the court astronomer either, uh, either saved his neck or saved somebody's neck by, by, by that quick thinking. And, the, and his argument was that, well, Aphrodite had taken it and by in, in uh, honoring Bernice's sacrifice, put it up in the stars. That's kind of a cool story. But it does have a couple of uh, galaxies that are, again, are, are acceptable under modest telescopes in, in decent skies. And this one is a very cool one, Black-Eyed Galaxy, um, which is uh, an 8.4. Uh, 10 by five uh, arc seconds, so or arc minutes. So it's it's real doable. Here's another one, NG4725, and over here is a beautiful one, the Needle Galaxy, very long and very thin, and and, and pretty obvious to find. So there is just a lot of good stuff if you have a modest telescope and you have and you have the desire to go galaxy hunting. This is the time to look for it. So one last thing I want to do before I run out of time here is I, I want to I, I talk just a little bit about the fact of that there really is a plethora of galaxies in this system area. Now recognize we're only 9.7, but what would happen if we just kind of upped this a little bit? And you notice now, we're beginning, I'm gonna get rid of this needle galaxy thing, there we go. And you notice now we begin to see some clusters. And we begin to see now we're up to 13 and a half, which is, which is doable with a, with in, in dark skies and in a decent sized telescope, these galaxies can be seen, but you're beginning to see a cluster over here, a cluster over here, and a huge cluster over here. This is the Virgo cluster, this is the Leo cluster, and this is the Coma cluster. And, and this one is surrounded, is, is around, uh, around Virgo A. So we're gonna begin to see these clusters and I'm just gonna, just gonna ramp it up just, just for giggles because you can do this on a program like this. And we're just gonna begin to continue to see how many galaxies there are in this area. Now we're up to 15, mag 15. And again, you can really see the, the clusters that are, that are going on. And if we, just for giggles again, keep going, keep going, keep going, 
keep going. <laughs> and and but now, but now see now we we've, we've all read about we've all read about voids and walls of galaxies. And to take a look, you can begin to see them. You begin to see how there are voids and there are these these membranes. And it really is, I mean, really, literally, you can keep going. This, this is a pretty cool program. But you can begin to see how, how many galaxies there are in all of these different areas. So in conclusion, get out there and observe. Thank you, Jerry. Fabulous as always. Jerry, you have to stop sharing. You got a couple questions in the house, Jerry. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, how are we gonna do this? Got another mic? Yeah, but then won't go over the it won't go over the Zoom call. By the way, uh, this this program, this Sky Safari Pro, which is which was given to uh, MAS for these presentations. So. Uh, um, don't hesitate to support one of our supporters. Okay, Dave, your question. Yes. Uh, Gary, can you make a comment about the Google questions and how we make the questions? Would you like to make a comment about that, Dave? <laughs> so uh, repeat the question, Jerry. Yes, or else no one else can hear you. So the question is about how what jerry was just pointing out relates to the able clusters and if you look on the screen those of us who can see the screen don't 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 make it you know go back jerry the other way it gets too many galaxies forest and the trees kind of like, yeah right there so the big one in the middle is the virgo cluster which is not actually an able cluster it's the only big galaxy cluster that's not an able cluster because it was too big for george able to put it on his list. It's uh, 60 million light years away. But the one on the upper left, that small one, the Coma Cluster, is a 310 million light years away. And that's actually much denser. That's the best hunting ground for galaxies for a large reflecting telescope. It has probably 10,000 galaxies, where the Virgo has maybe 2,000. And the Leo cluster is probably not as big as the Coma cluster, but again, it's bigger than the Virgo cluster. The Virgo cluster is the best for, for smaller telescopes because it's so much closer to us. But George Abel had over 4,000 clusters off the Palomar Observatory Sky Survey plate back in the 1950s. And of course, we are oh. part of the Virgo supercluster. That's and that's all kind of all part of that. Are there any other questions? Anybody knows any questions online? Nice job. <laughs> Dave and Jerry, it says. All right. And again, get out there and observe. All right, Jerry. Can you stop sharing, please? Yes. Sir. Stand by. Why do I have this? <laughs> Yeah, if anybody's online, we need to verify that we can hear you. So there is the king, the queen, and the crown. Um, next month, we have Chuck Allen. Chuck Allen, who missed us because of a, a storm at his house. He wasn't able to join us, but he'll be back in, next month with the James Webb Space Telescope mission. He's going to talk about that. That should be just fabulous. Um, and tonight, tonight with us over over uh, over the Zoom call is uh, Nat, Nancy Atkinson. She is an author. She's been a, a, a journalist. Uh, I know she writes for uh, Space. Was it Space.com? I think it is. Yeah, Universe Today. That's what it is. Um, thank you, Ron. But she's going to talk to us tonight about incredible stories from space, or at least that's what was communicated to me. Um, so everyone, please welcome uh, Nancy Atkinson.
Hi, everybody. How's it going? We can hear you well in the house here. So if we can hear you, then everybody online can hear you. And that's just fabulous. Okay, that sounds great. Well, um, I'm going to figure out how to share my screen here. There, how's that? That's good. Okay, that's great. Okay. Well, yeah, last time I was uh, with you guys, um, I had talked about the second book that I had written, which was about the Apollo program. Well, this is the first book that I wrote, <clears throat> Incredible Stories from Space. And this book is a look at, an inside look at NASA's robotic missions to explore the solar system and beyond. So missions like the Mars Curiosity rover, um, Hubble Space Telescope, and, uh, and some of the spacecraft that I wrote about are no longer with us, like the Cassini spacecraft or the, or the Dawn mission. Uh, but some of the missions are still ongoing, like the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, uh, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, and the Solar Dynamics Observatory, just to name a few. So in this book, I take a look at the technology and uh, the, the science and the exciting discoveries that are being made by these missions and how these discoveries are really changing our view and our understanding of the cosmos. But most of all, what I wanted to do was to tell about the humans uh, side of this mission of all these missions, because even though these are um, uncrewed missions, you know, robotic spacecraft with no people on board, there are still a lot of people involved. And so for this book, I interviewed 37 NASA scientists and engineers who work on these missions. And what I found is that these people really bring a lot of dedication and enthusiasm and emotion to what they do. And they do their work with great care because uh, they know that one mistake could cost the entire mission. But these people really exemplify how science is really a human endeavor. You know, it takes humans to ask the questions that send us on these journeys of exploration. It takes humans to build the spacecraft takes humans to figure out the trajectories and the ephemerides that tells us where everything is in space and exactly what time. And it takes the human mind to analyze the data. But even if you're not a rocket scientist, it doesn't take a lot to be just awed and amazed at the just amazing and intrinsically beautiful images from space and to be in awe and in wonder at the marvelous new findings from faraway places. Um, and so uh, in the book, I kind of weave together the story of the, the missions, as well as the people who work on them. And, uh, you know, I, I got to ask these people, what's it like to take a spacecraft that you've so delicately built, and then put it on top of a, an exploding rocket? <laughs> and uh, what are the challenges of operating these spacecraft that can be millions of miles away, away from Earth? And uh, I, one of the interesting things I found out was that uh, these scientists even anthropomorphize their, their robot spacecraft, just like I do. So that was kind of endearing for me to find that out. And uh, so I'd like to introduce you to some of the robots that I wrote about and some of the people that I wrote about uh, and share some of the images from space and the, and the findings from the missions. Uh, the first chapter in this book is about the New Horizons mission to Pluto. And uh, this mission has really been a long time in coming, and, and now it's really lasting a long time as well. One of the main drivers, the main people behind this mission was Alan Stern, who, if you follow NASA at all, you probably are fami familiar with his name. He's been a lot involved with a lot of missions. He's been with NASA for a while. He was even the, the uh, head of the science mission directorate for a while. So he's been involved in a lot of different things, and uh, he was a wonderful person to talk to. Uh, I start the book by um, uh, explaining how when I was interviewing him, he was doing multiple things at once, but he never missed a beat, and he gave me a great interview, and uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, when New Horizons launched back in January of 2006, it was the fastest spacecraft ever launched. It reached the moon in just nine hours. And of course, you probably know that it took the Apollo missions three days to reach the moon. It reached Jupiter in 13 months, but still it took nine and a half years to travel the 3 billion miles to the Pluto system way out there on the edge of the solar system. So it's, uh, I think that's a good indicator of just the great distances that we have in our, in our solar system. And the interesting thing about, um, 
what happened during the mission was just shortly after this mission launched, the International Astronomical Union decided they were going to uh, reclassify Pluto as not a planet. And it's a, it's a dwarf planet. And um, that kind of upset the people who really love Pluto. Uh, you know, Pluto's kind of the, the underdog, the little guy, the, the, the planet that never got any respect. I guess it's kind of endearing because it's got the, uh, the name that reminds us of Walt Disney, even though Pluto is really the, the god of the underworld that the, the planet was named after. But, uh, you know, uh, they started finding a bunch of other objects out there on the edge of the uh, edge out, out by Pluto that were similar to, to Pluto, these Kuiper Belt objects. So they kind of had to change, change their classification, but that upset a lot of people. Uh, what did we know about Pluto before the New Horizons mission? Um, to tell the truth, not actually a lot. Uh, we knew that it had this kind of weird orbit than, than, other, uh, than the rest of the solar system. Uh, these are some of the best images that we had before New Horizons. The kind of pixelated blob there on the right is, one of, is a, a single image taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And the ones on the, on the left there are stacked images taken by Hubble uh, over several years. And that gave us a little clearer look at what Pluto might look like, but still it's kind of nondescript. So what did we find when New Horizons finally got to Pluto? This, this amazing look at this amazing planet. And uh, what New Horizons found is a world that is just really, really interesting. Um, a lot of amazing geological features, and it's probably really um, uh, an active world. Uh, just last week, some new, new news came out from data from the New Horizons mission uh, that there's probably still ice volcanoes on, on Pluto that are actually still erupting. So that's, that's pretty amazing, I think. Um, the large kind of bright, flat, heart-shaped area is a sheet of, of nitrogen ice, and along the periphery of this flat area are mountain ranges with, with uh, really tall mountains. They have elevations about as high as the Rockies in Colorado. And these mountains are probably made of water ice because uh, nitrogen is not strong enough to form mountains. And uh, you can just see some of the detail and um, those cracks in the image that are, that's on the, on the right there, that's an indication that the, the ice is freezing and thawing and freezing again. That's those kind of uh, thaw freeze cycles ca cause the kind of cracks like that in the ice. So that means that Pluto could be warm enough at certain times in its orbit. Um, so there's a lot of things going on on Pluto. This is probably one of my favorite images from the entire mission. Uh, just look at the, the incredible detail there. You can see these ice mountains there in the foreground. But the most interesting thing to me is just look above Pluto and you can see its atmosphere. There are over two uh, dozen atmospheric layers there. And uh, also the scientists found evidence of clouds in Pluto's atmosphere. So it's just a really, really interesting place. One of the people that I interviewed is Alice Bowman. She is known as the mom of the mission and mom stands for the mission operations manager. And so she works at uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, the, um, the lab out there. And one of the really great stories that she told me was just 10 days before New Horizons was supposed to make its flyby of Pluto, they lost contact with the spacecraft. And so they worked around the clock to try to regain communications and they had to uh, re-upload what they were uploading the mission plan for the flyby. And it was just a really tense time, but, uh, but everything worked out and they, the mission worked perfectly. Um, one of the other things that uh, we found out about the Pluto system, we knew that Pluto had its moon Charon, but on the way there, uh, New Horizons in kind of in, in concert with the Hubble Space Telescope found four other moons as well. And New Horizons really didn't get a chance to look at them too closely but these are the pictures that we have right now. 
And after the flyby of, new, of, of Pluto in 2015, excuse me, uh, the, the mission is still going. It's, it's powered by uh, nuclear power, so it's still going out there. And in January 1st of 2019, it flew by another object. Uh, it originally had the name of Ultima Tool, but uh, it's been renamed as Erikoff. And when they first saw this object, far, you know, they were searching for objects that they could fly past. They thought it was a, a binary object, as you can see in this picture here. But here's what it turned out to be. It was actually uh, an object that's two pieces that are connected together and it's about as flat as a pancake. It's a really, really interesting object. And uh, they're still you know, studying the data that came back. It takes a long time to get all the data back from New Horizons because it's so far away. Currently, I think it takes about six hours uh, one-way communication time. And data like pictures, really takes a lot of bandwidth. And so they're actually still getting some of the images and data back from, from Erikoff. They're also still searching, and here's, a, here's another picture of, of Erikoff as well. Um, they're currently, the mission team is working on finding another object that they can fly by. Um, I keep seeing kind of cryptic tweets from Alan Stern on Twitter that they're, they keep having meetings and uh, um, kind of planning sessions of, of where they could be, uh, what object they could be flying by. And I expect that we'll hear another flyby of this mission, or uh, another object that this mission will be flying by soon. Next, I wanna talk about a, a mission that's a little bit closer to home, uh, the Mars uh, Curiosity rover. And that uh, landed back in 2012. And Curiosity is a, uh, about a, the size of a car, a small car. It has 17 cameras and 10 different instruments. And right now it's climbing a mountain. It's, uh, it landed here in Gale Crater and it's climbing the mountain in the middle called Mount Sharp. And uh, Curiosity's mission was to figure out how Mars evolved over billions of years and determine if it once was or even now is capable of supporting microbial life. We all know that getting to Mars is hard. And, uh, you know, I think in the past, I think the number that I've heard is that the 40, more than 40 spacecraft have been sent to Mars, been sent to Mars by, by uh, all of the various uh, uh, space agencies. And, you know, uh, I think about a third of them have, have not been successful. And so that's, it's really hard getting to Mars. And Curiosity was gonna use a brand new landing system. And it was, it was a, a system that could never be tested really on earth because you know, even in our atmosphere, they couldn't test it properly. So every, the whole thing, the first time the whole thing uh, was, was uh, put, into, put into play was uh, when it actually happened on Mars. And this landing uh, sequence, it takes about seven minutes to go from the top of Mars atmosphere down to landing on the ground. And so the engineers call it seven minutes of terror because you really honestly don't know if this is gonna work or not. Uh, you know, so the thrusters, the heat shield, the parachute, and one of the most complicated landing systems ever devised was the final kind of last linchpin. It was called the Sky Crane. And it was a hovering rocket stage that would lower the rover on cables, kind of like a rappelling mountaineer, and then uh, allow the rover to soft land directly on its wheels. And one of the worries was that this hovering stage might come and crash down right on top of the rover. Uh, but if it all worked right, it would zoom away and kind of uh, at full throttle to, to crash land far away from Curiosity. And all this had to be done automatically with no input from anyone on Earth. Um, because uh, one of the interesting things is Mars is about 100, was about 150 million miles away uh, from Earth at the time that Curiosity landed and the radio delay signal, the radio signal delay time was about 13 minutes. So by the time that seven minute uh, sequence ha happened uh, or didn't happen, you, 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 know, you didn't know if it had happened or not. So um, NASA put together a really great trailer 
and I want to share that with you right now. Hopefully the audio and everything will work. Um, and what it shows is uh, it takes that seven minutes and kind of condenses it down a little bit to about uh, three and a half minutes. And it shows the people in mission control that were monitoring Curiosity's landing. And then there's some computer graphics showing what was happening on Mars or what should have been happening on Mars with the, with the rover. So here you go. So I think I've seen that video dozens of times and it still gets me every time. <laughs> it chokes me up. It's just a, just a really, really great video. I, you may have known or may have heard at the end, they said, we've got thumbnails, we've got thumbnails. So the rover was programmed to immediately after it landed to take pictures of its surroundings so they could try to figure out where they were. And this picture here is the, one, is the first picture taken. And um, you can see in the corner there on the left is the rover's wheels. You can see the shadow of the rover. And right out in front of them there is, uh, is Mount Sharp, the, the mountain that, uh, that, that the rover was sent to study. And uh, I interviewed Ashwin Vasavada, who's the MSL project scientist. And he said, even though the rover has now taken thousands and thousands of images, this is still one of his favorite images because he said it was just like a preview of the whole mission right in front of us. There it was, there was the mountain. So as I said, uh, Curiosity has just taken thousands and thousands of pictures. Uh, this is a picture of Mount Sharp. And you can see uh, just the dozens of layers of sedimentary rock, perhaps built over millions of years. And these layers are telling us the story of Mars geologic and climate history. Just a really beautiful picture there. And uh, basically everywhere the rover looks, it's finding evidence of past water on Mars. And that's really intriguing because we know on Earth, everywhere we have water, we have life. So for example, in this kind of layered rock formation here, there's evidence that um, they were deposited, all these layers were deposited over time, over millions of years, and was part of an ancient lake. And here's some other really great pictures. Uh, there's a lot of sand dunes on Mars. This one here is uh, about 30 feet tall. So it's a really huge sand dune. 
the sand dunes are causing some problems for the um, not only Curiosity, but also for Perseverance rover that, that's now joined its uh, sister on Mars as well. They have to be really careful not to get stuck in the in the sand dunes. Um, that's what happened to uh, to one of the rovers. Uh, the Spirit rover got stuck in a sand dune and uh, really they couldn't get it out. And so that that's kind of detrimental to the, to the mission, of course. Uh, the slab of rock here, it's called. Uh, it was nicknamed Old Soaker, and it's a slab of rock that has a pattern of cracks called desiccation cracks. And these usually form when you have a layer of mud that's that's dried and the, the cracks kind of in, indicate alternating periods of wet and dry. And also there, there's evidence of mineral salts which indicate perhaps a saline lake, uh, a salty lake. And so uh, that would be kind of similar to what we see in the Atacama Desert. And you can see the rover's robotic arm there on the uh, image on the right. That's got a bunch of scientific tools. And uh, with those instruments, they've found trace elements like carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen. You know, these are all the basic building blocks of life. And so it's also found things like sulfur compounds um, and different in different chemical forms. So these, there's, you know, possible energy sources for microbes as well. The rover and the rover uh, picture tape, the people who are in charge of taking pictures, they really become adept at taking selfies of the rover. And you might wonder, how does a rover take a selfie? Well, this picture is actually made up of over uh, about 115 different pictures. And so the rover takes its robotic arm and kind of like how we take a selfie, we put our camera out in front of us and we uh, take one picture, but you know, it's got to take about 100 different pictures to get the whole scene in there. And the interesting part of this picture for me is that you can't see the rover's robotic arm on it because just like when we take a picture, when we take a selfie, our arm isn't in it, but you can see the shadow of the robotic arm on the ground there. So that's pretty interesting. So how do you drive a Mars rover? You know, some people have uh, visions of engineers with joysticks kind of operating the rovers remotely. But again, because of the delay time in the signals, uh, sending, sending messages back and forth, real-time operations just really aren't possible. So what happens is that every night the rover takes images of its surroundings and it sends them to Earth. And the rover drivers, that's really what their names are, rover drivers, they take these images and with special software that they have, they can create kind of a 3D version of the area that the rover's in. They can determine the best route and they can take into account any hazards that they see, as well as being able to stop at the targets that the scientists want to study as well. And so they create a program that will tell the rover what to do for the next day, and then it gets uploaded to the rover on Mars. And then the rover wakes up and it gets in instructions and it heads off to mm -hmm. the day for the day. This is uh, one of the traverse maps that uh, NASA has put together showing just how far the rover has gone. Of course, it's uh, getting close to 10 years that it's that it's been on Mars. So um, this, this drive map or this traverse map uh, was the last one that NASA put together. It's just getting too hard for them to get everything in one map. So now they have a, an interactive version that you can look at online. So if you just go to the Curiosity Rover website, you can find their interactive map and see where the rover is currently and where the rover is going to go. And, you know, it, it's the plan is to get farther up on, on uh, Mount Sharp. And uh, I think they don't re really actually want to go to the peak. They want to go to the place where they think there was a shoreline. If, if Gale Crater was full of water, there should be a shoreline at some place, at some point on the, on the mountain. So that's what they're looking for. And this is one of my favorite pictures that Curiosity took. It's a sunset on Mars. It looks so much like a sunset here on Earth. And, uh, you know, it just says how much the planets are, are similar, even though they're, they're quite different as well. 
I wanted to talk briefly about the Hubble Space Telescope just because it's such an iconic mission. And um, I was really privileged to be able to talk to so many people who work on this mission. And I got to go out to the uh, Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore and uh, see the work that they're doing out there. Uh, while I was there, they were getting ready for the James Webb Space Telescope. They were just building the operations room. And uh, so it's been fun to see that in, in uh, actually in action now that James Webb is, is, uh, is getting ready to, to wow us with, uh, with its images like we hope Hubble has done. Of course, Hubble has uh, rewritten our textbooks and uh, it's probably the, the most um, recognizable name for, for the general public as far as the things that uh, uh, the images and the, the, the kind of how it's really changed our understanding of the universe. Um, of course, you know the story of Hubble, how it, uh, when it was first launched in 1990, it had a problem where the images are blurry. It had a spherical aberration where the mirror was brown incorrectly. One thing that I uh, just recently found out and I got to write an article about it was, so they developed some computer algorithms to figure out how to, how to fix the, how to fix the um, spherical aberration, which basically they put eyeglasses on, on the, uh, on Hubble. And so these, those same, uh, computer algorithms are now being used to to refine the the mirror segments for James Webb and to get them to be aligned uh, to very precise uh, you know pr very precision alignment so that they can have such, have a really great uh, uh, you know take really great images and so uh, you know people have said that they're worried that. James Webb is so far away and nobody can go fix it if anything goes wrong. Well, basically because they can uh, be constantly aligning these mirrors, they, that sh there should be no problem as far as uh, a mirror being uh, 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 not aligned correctly. So that's, uh, that's good news. Of course, uh, Hubble has taken so many great images, but one of my favorite is the Hubble Deep Field. And of course, this is a, a famous image and Hubble has since take many, taken several other deep fields. This is an image of, uh, of basically what astronomers thought was a blank area in space. It's about the size of a grain of sand held at arm's length. And Hubble stared at it for several days. And what it saw in that, what we thought was a, a blank area, an empty area was this. And it's just full of galaxies. All of those spots, smudges, uh, bright lights are all galaxies. And that's just amazing. And basically everywhere Hubble has looked, uh, it sees these gal sees galaxies everywhere. You know, um, just mind boggling how big our universe is and how amazing uh, the Hubble is to be able to capture that. And if you saw the first image that, um, or one of the first images from James Webb now that was in, in focus, it was basically a deep field. Uh, if you look closely, there's the one bright star that has, uh, I should have added it here, but I didn't. There's one bright star that has uh, several spikes to it, but behind that is all sorts of galaxies. So again, uh, just with the first kind of um, engineering image that James Webb took, uh, we're, we're seeing something akin to a Hubble deep field. Some of the really interesting people that I talked to, uh, Helmut Jenkner, he's uh, a former director of the Hubble mission now. He's still working with the mission and he's been with the mission even before it launched. He is from Austria and he sounds just like Arnold Schwarzenegger, but uh, he is the warmest, funniest guy. And he told me some really great stories about the history of getting everything ready for the Hubble to, to be built and to be launched. And uh, um, you'll, I think you'll enjoy the stories from him in the book if you read it. Uh, Frank Seppolina is another just a really amazing guy. He, he, guy. he was in charge of figuring out how to fix Hubble and uh, how to actually train the astronauts to do the work to to put in what was called CoStar, which was the eyeglasses for Hubble. 
And uh, now he's working on a mission to, um, to service other satellites in space. And uh, he's, although he's, he's getting ready to retire, um, I think he is almost 90. So he's, he's quite, a, quite a really uh, interesting guy. Um, what time is it here? Let's talk a little bit about the, the Cassini mission at Saturn. Um, you know, Saturn is one of the most photogenic spots in our solar system. I'm sure you uh, all look at Saturn as often as you could. That was that was the uh, uh, one of the first things that I saw through a telescope was Saturn. And it, you know, like many people, my socks were blown off. So that's uh, uh, a favorite target of a lot of people. So. Uh, with Cassini, we've had the luxury of seeing the entire, entire Saturn system um, for close to 14 years, I think 14 or 15 years the mission lasted. And um, Saturn's clouds is, you know, everything. It's just such a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful planet. And with the Cassini mission, we've been able to study uh, the motion of the gases that, and, the, and the rings and uh, it just has been an amazing mission. Uh, Saturn's rings start just a little over 4,000 miles above the surface of the planet, and they extend out to 170,000 miles, meaning that Saturn and its rings would really fit nicely in the space between Earth and our moon. But the rings are really gossamer thin, less than 30 feet thick in some places. But up close, we can see some of the some of the ring particles that clump together and form features that tower above the rest. And with just the right sun angles, we can see that they create these big shadows. And then there are little moonlets that spin around through the rings, creating propeller shaped gaps in the rings. And we've seen how the moons within the rings can create wakes. And uh, you can see on the, the picture on the bottom left there, there's kind of a scalloped edge and that's from the moon, um, shoot, I can't remember if it's Pan, that's in there, it just kind of uh, spins inside that ring gap and it creates those scallops on the edges of the rings. And because of Cassini, we've been able to study the menagerie of over 60 moons and uh, some of the imagery that Cassini has sent back is just absolutely stunning with the rings and moons perfectly posed and these are amazing pictures, and I actually have some hanging in my in my uh, in my house. They're just museum quality pictures. And in the book, uh, I talk about one of uh, Saturn's moons, Enceladus, and it has geyser-like jets that spew water and vaporize particles. And this was one of the biggest surprises of the mission. And what the mission determined is that. Uh, there's an underground ocean beneath the icy crust of Enceladus and it could be up to six miles deep. And how this icy moon has enough heat to power those geysers is still, they're still trying to understand how this is happening. You know, ice, uh, Enceladus should be a big ice ball because of its location and how far it is away from the sun. But it's thought that the tidal action between Saturn and, and um, Enceladus is creating enough action and heat and, um, so it's, it's just one of the uh, kind of mysteries and really exciting places. And of course, um, uh, there's a lot of talk about sending a mission just to study Enceladus. So uh, that would be something to really look forward to in the future. Uh, in October of, um, oh shoot, I didn't write down the year, but uh, I think it was 2017 or 2018, um, they crashed the Cassini spacecraft into Saturn. Uh, they did this uh, because it's, it's known as planetary protection. They didn't want any microbes that might be hanging on to the spacecraft from Earth to, you know, if the spacecraft was wandering through the Saturn system, if it, was, if it ever collided with uh, one of the moons that might harbor life, they didn't want to contaminate it. So they crashed it into Saturn. And this is uh, on the top there, one of the, um, the final images that it took as it was uh, heading in to crash into Saturn. And it's a beautiful image. And uh, I've, I've seen a lot of artist concepts of what happened and uh, this is a great artist concept as well. Uh, the Cassini mission is just uh, 
we miss it. We miss the new images coming in, but uh, also the data is still being studied. And I think the Cassini mission will be giving us new findings for years and years to come, just like a lot of the other missions as well. Um, I think I'm going to stop there and uh, I'd be happy to take any questions if anybody has any about, um, about any of the missions that I talked about or anything that currently going on at NASA. Hi, uh, this is Suresh. Um, you had started out on the uh, New Horizons mission, you know, talking about those uh, new, newly discovered volcanoes or cryovolcanoes on Pluto. Mm -hmm. um, so now that's three worlds now that we found cryovolcanoes on, right? So Triton, Enceladus, and Pluto. Yeah. Plus with all the water they found on, you know, Gan Ganymede and Europa, and maybe even some others. What what is the current thinking? What's going on? Is water that prevalent in the outer solar system where you know these small bodies could collect them and, and shed them in this in this way? I think they're really surprised at the amount of of water that seems to be out there. So yeah, I, I think you're right. Uh, it's definitely um, uh, been a surprise. But and the fact that we have these cryovolcanoes is just really really intriguing and how they. Um, you know how they operate and what what is the this the mechanism behind them that that keeps them going you know uh, again some of these places are really really cold and how these operate is is just uh uh you know really intriguing and i i look forward to finding out more about them um i'm not an expert by, by any stretch of the imagination i just get to tell the fun stories about it but yeah that's definitely something we should keep an eye on and um you know, there's a new mission that is coming up in a few years called the Europa Clipper that will be studying Europa, and that is thought to have geysers or cryovolcanoes as well. So hopefully we can learn more from that mission as far as the mechanisms and how these cryovolcanoes operate. Thank you. The Pluto one is the most interesting to me since there's no other planet pulling on it. There's no... Uh, what do they call that? Uh, uh, tidal friction? T tidal, yeah. Well, Sharon is there, and I don't know, you know, they're, it's a kind of a binary system. They kind of orbit each other. I'm not sure if that would have any um, bearing on it, but um, yeah, it's it's just the, the, the chemistry is really intriguing. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's kind of like Titan, and it's uh, that was another part of the Cassini mission was studying Titan, and they found, uh, you know, like there was rain, methane rain on Titan, and uh, probably pools of methane water, lakes, uh, just really, really intriguing. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Nancy, this is Ron in uh, back in the room here. Hope your mom's okay. Yes, she's doing good. Hi, Ron. Fantastic. I wanted to find out what you're working on now. Um, well, people keep asking me if I'm going to write another book. And boy, that Apollo book really took a lot out of me. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was a lot to work on. It was, um, uh, it was really, really fun. But it was, I had a hard deadline of getting it done in time for the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 mission. So uh, I haven't gotten the... Uh, the, the oomph, the gumption to write another book, uh, even though I've had two different people approach me with two different ideas. So for now, I'm just still writing articles for Universe Today. I just started writing for another outlet called Supercluster. Uh, it's a really unique um, website. They do all their own artwork and uh, um, they have uh, a lot of cool apps that you can watch launches and you get notification when there's a launch and you can, they, they live stream them. They also have information on the International Space Station. Um, I also write for the Planetary Society and the National Space Society as well. So I definitely keep busy writing um, for all these various outlets. And, uh, but I, it also gives me flexibility as well uh, I did some traveling this winter with my husband, and uh, we enjoyed that, but I still kept busy writing. So that's what I've been up to these days. So they've given you two ideas. You need a third one? <laughs> I don't how, know what it's going to take. How about you do a book about Jerry? Oh, maybe I could. Well, Jerry, yeah, so Ron and I uh, 
corresponded about Jerry Woodfill, who was uh, an engineer for the Apollo program. And he, he was still working at NASA when he passed away earlier this year. And he was just an amazing, amazing person. Ron had the opportunity to meet him once. And um, so I miss him greatly. Uh, I did get to write about his story a lot, um, both on Universe Today and in my book. Uh, he was uh, the uh, inspiration behind a series of articles that I wrote on Apollo 13 called 13 Things That Saved Apollo 13. And then Jerry, uh, five years later, I wrote that for the 40th anniversary of Apollo 13. And then five years later for the 45th, Jerry contacted me again and said, I've got some more ideas. I've got So we wrote 13 more things that saved Apollo 13. And uh, Jerry is just a, a dynamic guy, uh, really uh, funny, amazing, and uh, uh, miss him a lot. So yeah. Hi, Nancy. This is Matt that I'm, I am in the big room too. Um, I was a little preoccupied when you mentioned Titan. And I guess if you said anything about a future mission, like, are they thinking of drilling in and go, huh? Dragonfly. Dragonfly. Did you already talk about that? Oh, okay. Are you going to? Drone helicopter. No submarine? Oh, I thought they were going under Titan's crust, uh, ice too. No. Uh, I think Europa is that the plan is to, um, I'm not sure how the Europa Clipper mission is going to work. Um, if it's going to, if it's just going to fly through the geysers and take samples, or if they're actually going to send a probe down to the surface. Does anybody remember? I can't remember. Yeah, I remember so the Clipper is going to use radar to uh, shoot down and find a thin spot in the ice. And then the lander will be a follow on and that will be setting down, taking soundings, lifting up and moving. And then the third mission, they're hoping to drill. And right now down in Antarctica, they're trying a, a drilling technique where they would take a nuclear core. They take the heat from it as it decays and let that melt through the ice and they trail an antenna behind on the surface. And then as it continues to go down, the ice continues to freeze above it. And then finally, the probe will break out into the water and open up and deploy a little submarine. Okay. The water Europa. <laughs> yeah. So awesome. Yeah, it sounds like yeah. science fiction, but it's really, really cool. Yeah, the last shot will be this like, you know, huge European kraken coming at it with its jaws open and, <laughs> and then it cuts to black. Oh, I love your descriptions, Ron. <laughs> Uh, Nancy? Yes. Mark. Um, one of my pet peeves is uh, basically people that wonder, why are we bothering space? Uh, do you have that kind of uh, attitude of people wondering, why are we bothering space when there's gladiator uh, coliseums we can build, bridges to nowhere? Why are we spending money in space when we can build it, build, spend money on Earth? Which comes to bring to me the question, would you be interested in writing a book basically it's postulating where would we be if the space program had happened or certain changes like we continue the moon landings a little science fiction but uh yeah the people to think about where we would be because i've actually talked about the idea of where would we if the space program never happened and some people figure we'd be lucky if we got the 70s or the 1960s level technology right exactly but, what do you think about the people who uh, talk about this waste of money that is? Thank you. Well, there are so many things that we just take for granted that are either were developed because of the spacecraft, space program, or uh, the development of it just was, uh, to coin a phrase, you know, skyrocketed because it was needed for the Apollo program or for the shuttle program. And, uh, you know, things we take for granted, like smoke detectors, uh, you know, that we have in our houses to save lives, uh, so much medical equipment, you know, all the monitors that they needed for the, for the Apollo program that they wanted to keep tabs on what the astronauts, if their heart rate was going uh, out of whack or something. Um, those kind of medical uh, equipment that we, that we take for granted today. I mean, that, that was just, that was developed because of, of, of Apollo. And, 
you can go to NASA's, um, uh, oh shoot, I can't remember the name of it now, the uh, anywhere where they kind of- Spinoffs. Spinoffs, thank you, thank you. The NASA spinoff website where they kind of showcase all the technology that uh, that they've, you know, they, they gladly share the technology. There's a lot of technology transfer to small companies, to small businesses that NASA says here, we've got this great technology, how can you use it? And, you know, it's, it's spurring a lot and lot of, of technology development. So, um, yeah, I think you're right that, you know, com computers, you know, definitely NASA did not invent the computer or the, uh, or the chips that they, they were, they were starting to use back then. Uh, but because NASA needed that technology, the technology just, it, it was developed so much quicker than, than what, what it would have been if, if we didn't have it. So yeah, that would be an interesting science fiction book to, to write if we had never gone to space, what our life would be like on earth. That would, that's, a, that's an interesting thought problem. So yeah, that, that might be an interesting book, but. Or where would we be if we had continued the space exploration with the moon landings? Right. Yeah. My, my favorite line about going to Mars is that it's always 15 years off, you know, well, you know, with the SLS rocket, you know, we should be get, we should be able to get to Mars in 15 to 20 years. Well, I think they have said that ever since I, I have been alive, <laughs> we should be able to get to Mars in, in 15 to 20 years. So, yeah, uh, but as I said, Mars is really, really hard and uh, we really don't have the technology yet or the understanding of how to land large payloads on Mars. So landing there is, um, right now it's, it's, it's a no-go as far as landing human size payloads. So we've got to figure out how to land something because the we can't land like we did on the moon because there's too much atmosphere and you can't use those kind of thrusters in a, in an atmosphere. It's, it's, it's not stable and you can't land like we do on earth with parachutes and using the atmosphere to slow down because the atmosphere is too thin on Mars. So it's a real kind of, uh, you know, just, it's a horrible in between atmosphere that causes a lot of problems that nobody really knows how to how to deal with it yet so uh, and that's something that's not really talked about that much but uh, it's it's a real issue so uh, they are testing something uh, I think it's called a torus where it's kind of an inflatable torus that you know would inflate and be really huge to slow down a big spacecraft but um, that's something that still has to be figured out as far as getting to Mars. Where would you like to go? Where what would be your your favorite place to go? I'd be actually interested in going back to the moon. Okay, we can uh, launch probes and other things safely from the moon, easier from the moon than we would from Earth. Not to mention yep. thinking more of the line of um, planetary defense, mm -hmm. Not alien type thing. For me, it's uh, think back twenty thirteen when that uh, asteroid blew up over Russia. Yeah. Now, ask yourself, what if that had happened back during the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis? Yeah. Or even right now today at the, uh, with the Ukrainian mess. Mm -hmm. That is something that happened and caught everyone flat-footed. And right okay. now, despite those idiot movies, and I say idiot, uh, Deep Impact and Armageddon. Great science, uh, great sci-fi uh, special effects, I guess good acting, but absolutely horrid, lousy, despicable pseudoscience. Right. And the thing is, we don't know what's up there. That's the really scary part. We know yeah. nothing of our own solar system, what could be an immediate threat to us. And by the time we'd know about it, Hasta la vista, baby. Yeah. Right. Yeah, there's a there's a mission that's on its way to a asteroid right now called the DART mission, and they're going to test um, uh, and kind of an asteroid redirect uh, where they're 
So it's an asteroid and it's got a little moonlet and they're actually going to smash. Uh, no, are they going to smash into the moonlet or are they going to try to do a gravity tractor? I can't remember. I think it's uh, a gravity track. I think it's a gravity tractor. Yep. So they're going to change change the orbit of the moonlet and they should be able to measure how much they can change it by how how its orbit changes around the the asteroid. So that's a that's a really big test. I mean, that's a that's one of the most sophisticated asteroid deflection techniques that we've got and it's uh, that's a really good test for it. So that should be that should that should be really exciting to follow. Um, yeah, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. A lot of people are have been trying to sound the alarm for years saying, hey, it's not a matter of if this is going to happen. It's a matter of when we get hit by a large asteroid or a, you know, even a medium-sized one is, is going to cause a lot of issues. So that's something definitely we need to spend a lot more um, resources on. But uh, of course, the political will is part of that. And um, yeah, it's... Uh, There's an old book from the 1970s you might want to take a look. I think it was Larry Niven, Lucifer's Hammer. You ever heard of it? Yeah, I have. I haven't read it, though. It's a take on the idea of... Uh, a comet, one of those extra long periodical ones that does like every 20, 30,000 years or so. Okay. And uh, its latest orbit basically has Earth in its bullseye. Yeah. So it's been an aspect of that. So something yep. to take a look at. Thank you. Yep, you bet. Anybody else in the room? Well, thank you, Nancy. Yeah, you bet. Thanks for asking me uh, to, to join you. And uh, I really had a great time. Always good to see all you and, and uh, chat with you. Yes, awesome. Thank you very much. And you know, you can come back anytime. Okay, thanks a lot. Nice round of applause for you here in the room. So, well, thanks. everyone else, that is uh, the end of our meeting tonight. Um, all, all those of you online, hey, maybe we'll see you here next month because we'll be here 